thank you for uh, uh, taking the time. We have a, a standing room only crowd, which is pretty awesome, always right, Doc? Nice, always nice. Yes, thank you all for coming out and for your interest in the finest hours. I was a little disappointed to see, not many people have seen it, but I do hope you go and see it. It's, a, it's an amazing story, it's a true story. Um, you know, I didn't know a thing about the Coast Guard before I made that movie, and I have the utmost respect for what they do. This took place in 1952 off the coast of Chatham, and the little boat that you see in this clip here is actually still around. It's in Chatham. You can visit it. I know that uh, Paula Rooney was down there and, and was on that. So it's it's just it's an amazing story. It's uplifting. It's very inspirational, and I, I think it, it's worth going to see. Absolutely, and. Uh... Uh, fewer of you raised your hand when you said, uh, did you read the book? So, go see the film and while it's in theaters. Please go uh, read the book as well because it's really a story about, about New England and about leadership and all of these different um, aspiring or inspiring uh, themes that, that we like to write about and put on film as, as storytellers. I call myself the accidental author. I never believed I'd be writing books one day, but that is until I was thrust into the spotlight because of my work on one case. One of the biggest cases in the history of American crime, as Megan mentioned, it was the Boston Strangler case. Now for me, this was a, a personal crusade because the youngest and final victim was my 19-year-old aunt, Mary Sullivan. And that, uh, that story and that case led me to journalism school because my family never believed the official um, uh, wording or the official cause of death for all these victims. So I reinvestigated the case uh, as a journalism student, then went on uh, for a career in uh, television news for about 10, 15 years. And as I was becoming very high profile in the case, I was on all of these different television shows talking about uh, the tragedy and talking about the need to reinvestigate these crimes. All these um, well-known authors at the time reached out to me and they said, Casey, you know, this is a fascinating story. Can, you know, we, we would love to write this. People like Sebastian Younger, who had written The Perfect Storm, for example. And at first, I was very flattered. And I went home that night and I thought, geez, you know, these, these big-time authors want, want to tell my story. And then I, you know, paused, had a soda or a beer at that time, and I said, wait a minute. Uh, I'm living this. Uh, I'm, 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 a, I'm a journalist. Uh, I have to write this story. And it's either going to succeed or fail on those merits. And as being a journalist, you know the who, what, where, when, and how. And you know how to tell a story from that perspective, but you don't really know how to write a book. And I tell writers all the time, I said, if you ever want to write a book, be an avid reader. Read everything, because you will pick and choose and learn techniques from some of the best writers out there that you can translate to your own story. I sat down, and, and that's what I did. And a year later, surprisingly, I had a, a, a surprise bestseller on my hands. And as I was doing all of the research and the promotional um, junkets for uh, A Rose for Mary, The Hunt for the Real Boston Strangler, something led me to Chatham, Chatham, Massachusetts. I grew up on Cape Cod, where this story happened. Never knew this story ever existed. And I call myself a historian, right? Never knew it. So I'm in Chatham, this beautiful little idyllic town on Cape Cod, doing a book signing, signing these Boston Strangler books, when my brother, who is really, he's my security at these, uh, at these book signings, because you know I, I hear about a lot of authors who have these groupies that follow them around. Well, I usually have ex-prisoners and cons and dangerous people who follow me around. So I need my brother to kind of you know, look over the crowd and see if there's somebody nefarious up there. So he shows up a half hour before my book signing, and he sees a little uh, memorial to this rescue on a rock across the street from the Chatham Coast Guard Station. And he runs up to me at the, uh, at the book signing and says, Casey, I have your next book. And he told me what little he knew about it. And as Dorothy mentioned, the lifeboat that you just saw on film is actually a real living, breathing thing. You can go down and visit it on Cape Cod. That was the first thing I did. And I thought, I saw it, 36 feet long. I said, how did this small lifeboat save so many men? And then as a journalist, as a writer, the second thing you do is you try to find the people involved. Fortunately for Dorothy and I, 
many of the men who uh, performed this rescue back in 1952, they were still alive. The unfortunate thing for me while I was writing The Finest Hours, they didn't want to share their story. They told me to go away. Bernie Weber, the hero that Chris Pine plays on screen, when I called him to talk about the movie, or <laughs> before that, when I called him to talk about the book, he said, uh, there's no story here. I want to be left alone. And I'd just done a lot of research, and I knew he was wrong, and I thought, why wouldn't he want to share his story? You know, is, that, is it that humble heroism? You know, he was a leader, but, you know, that, that World War II generation of people that had a job to do, they didn't, uh, you know, boast about it. They moved on in their lives. That was part of it. But Bernie was also haunted by this rescue because 32 men do get saved that night. One man never came back. And Bernie always said it was an unsuccessful rescue based on that. Well, as a journalist and as a writer, you know, part of your job and your skill set is to gain the confidence of the people that you're telling the stories of. Dorothy's the, Dorothy's the best at it, in my opinion, on the Hollywood side. On the writing side, I had to call Bernie uh, twice a week for six weeks. And we never talked about the rescue. We talked about how shitty the Boston Red Sox were doing at the time and how bad the weather was up in, uh, up in Boston. And he loved that because he was in warm, sunny Florida. So eventually, he said, OK, I'm ready to tell the story. And he talks about it. And you could see 60 years of frustration, pain, and anger literally just bleed off of his shoulders. And it is true. The story, everything about it that you see on screen or that you read in the book actually happened in real life. In 1952, four men were given a suicide mission during a storm where two oil tankers were split in half. Now, how many people have seen The Perfect Storm, the movie? Yeah, oh, great. Remember those waves, how high and big those were? Well, same waves in this storm, but the storm is also compounded by a blinding blizzard. So uh, devastating and violent that it literally sheared two oil tankers in half, leaving 84 men trapped on the bow and stern sections of each of these vessels. And at the heart of the finest hours is the story of these four young men given a suicide mission to take a 36-foot lifeboat out into those gigantic seas with a simple order, save as many men as you can. And they do it. And how they do it is still considered the greatest small boat rescue in American history. So I had the great fortune, along with my uh, co-author, Mike Togas, to tell this story and to write this book. And the book became a bestseller when it came out in 2009. And I remember thinking, this is a layup. Hollywood is going to love this story. It's, it's uh, the perfect storm of a happy ending, is what it is. And I waited for somebody like Dorothy to call me. She didn't. Nobody did, actually. So I, I, you know, I got a literary agent to book me a few um, meetings in Hollywood when the book came out, and I would go in front of these executives. I didn't know where they were in the food chain of these studios, but I was just so happy to be in the room. And I would make this impassioned plea and pitch on why Hollywood should make this movie. And they would have tears in their eyes after, I, after my 20-minute talk. And they would say, Casey, that was beautiful, but we're going to tell you three reasons why the movie is never going to get made. One, it's a period piece. This rescue takes place in 1952. And unless that ship that they're going to rescue is called Titanic, it's never going to happen. Two, um, it takes place on the ocean a very costly investment for any uh, studio to make. And three, we're Hollywood. We only make movies about superheroes. Yep. No. And I said, exactly. I said, this is a movie about superheroes. They don't wear capes. They don't wear tights. They wear hand-me-down foul weather gear from World War II. They're ordinary men given some training that do extraordinary things. And even that pitch didn't really go over well with anybody. I go back to Boston, and for the next year, <laughs> everywhere I went, guys, and you know, this crosses all, all, all sorts of industries. Be very passionate and determined about what you're doing in life. No matter if I was going to get a cup of coffee at Dunkin' Donuts or filling up my gas tank at the mobile station, I had two copies of my book on me at all times. Because I knew I'd meet somebody. I'd meet somebody that would help me make this movie because the heroes 
despite saying that they didn't want this story told, once the book came out, once they knew it, they thought more people need to know this. You know, some people will read the book, more people are going to see the movie. And, um, and I felt very passionate about that. That became my mission, and later Dorothy's mission, to get this movie made. So a year later, she and I meet for the first time. And she is interested in another book that I've written. It's a true crime book, a real gritty novel. And I'm so excited to meet Do Dorothy Alfiero because she just produced The Fighter. Have you, anybody seen The Fighter, I hope? Great movie, right? Awesome movie. And, I, and, you know, everybody's already talking about the Oscars for this. So I sit down with her and I make this pitch on this. Okay, so now I'm going to pick up. Yes, yeah. please.